Howdy folks, hope you've all had a good weekend, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles, where this week I'm not going to be talking about wargaming at all, because frankly, I'm just sick to death of them. Well, okay, there are actually two things that I need to talk about, but I promise I'll be quick, um, and I'm only bringing them up because they have been popping up in the comments of previous videos. The first is to do with the playable Captain Jingles in World of Warships because as I'm sure many of you are probably aware, I am actually available to play as a playable captain in World of Warships. And people have been asking, Jingles, are you going to demand that Wargaming remove your likeness and your playable captain from the game? And no, of course I'm not. Because that would be incredibly petty of me. Also, there are plenty of people out there who enjoy playing Captain Jingles and listen to me constantly misidentifying ships. And the people who have earned me in-game as a playable captain have earned me in-game as a playable captain and I wouldn't want to take that away from them. Now, it's entirely possible that Wargaming are going to remove me from the game as a playable captain, but I don't think they will for exactly the same reasons. Not least of which because that would be incredibly petty of them. Although we are talking here about a company that published a bonus code telling one of its former community contributors to go and screw himself. So anything's possible but I don't anticipate it happening. And the second question that many people have been asking is, Jingles, are you going to stop doing World of Warships videos? And the simple answer to that one is, no, I'm not. Because I love the game. I think it's a great game. I don't have a problem with the game. I think the game's fantastic. It's the company publishing and developing it that I have issues with. Plus, you guys love seeing your greatest moments in World of Warships immortalised on YouTube here on the channel, so again, this is not something that I'm going to take away from you. Plus, you know, I have to earn a living as well. And yep, I'm being brutally honest here. My World of Warships videos are by far the most popular stuff that I do, and I still have to put food on the table. At the same time, though, you've probably noticed that I have been diversifying my content away from strictly wargaming titles. And hopefully that'll be successful, because I'll be able to continue doing that. But, well, if the World of Warships videos are the only videos that people watch, then they will continue to be the majority of the content available on the channel. It's simple economics, kids. If you don't watch the other content, if you don't enjoy the other content, there's going to be less of the other content. That's just the way it works. But again, I don't really have that much of a problem with continuing to do World of Warships videos, because, like I said, I love the game so do many of you. It's the reason why people are so passionate about the direction in which the company is taking the game, because we love the game so much. Plus, I have been, and intend to continue doing videos, calling Wargaming out on their shit, and at least attempting to keep them honest. And if I was doing that on an Alien Spire Team video, or a Microsoft Flight Sim video, or a War Thunder video, it would be, well, kind of weird. And on the subject of War Thunder, while I'm sure many of you are looking forward to more War Thunder content, and they will be, let us not forget that Gaijin aren't exactly saints themselves either. Because if I were to restrict the videos on this channel to gameplay footage from games whose developers and publishers were entirely clean of wrongdoing, there would not be a lot of games out there for me to cover. I would be looking at a lot of independent games, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but absolutely nothing from double or triple A publishers, because they are all scumbags. Wargaming aren't that much worse than anybody else. Although they do seem to be taking it as a bit of a challenge to see if they can be worse than Electronic Arts and Ubisoft lately, but on the whole, they're not that much worse. And to all those people who have accused me of being a massive hypocrite by continuing to publish World of Warships content, have you seen the World of Warships content I've published over the course of the last two weeks? None of it has been particularly flattering to Wargaming, has it? To those people who've been insisting that I'm doing nothing but advertising the game, while for the last two weeks doing nothing but ripping Wargaming a new one in every Wargaming-related video that I've uploaded, if you think that is advertising, then clearly we have such vastly different interpretations of the word that there is absolutely no point whatsoever in continuing to have this conversation. Either that, or you are a colossal troll. And either way, honestly, I think it would just be best for all involved if we all just agreed to go our separate ways. And yeah, 
I've now approached the five minute mark in a video where I swore I wasn't going to talk about wargaming and I've so far done nothing but. Sorry about that, but there were a couple of points that needed to be cleared up before we could move on. And speaking of diversifying my content, it can't help but have come to your attention that we're running Horde Mode in Aliens Fireteam Elite in the background of this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. For those of you who've seen the videos that I've done of this or who have followed either Flambass or Mr. Gibbons' live stream, this has been such a breath of fresh air. I haven't had as much fun playing a game as Aliens Fireteam Elite in living memory. I'm sure that the novelty is going to wear off before too long. And I do have concerns about the longevity of the game, because, well, I've already completed the campaign, and it shipped with uh, four campaigns, each of three missions, so 12 missions, each of which will probably take you anything between half an hour to an hour to complete, depending on, well, how quickly you blitz through it, and what kind of difficulty settings you're playing it on. But I did have initial concerns over the fact that, well, I've basically been playing it for a weekend and I've already completed it, except I haven't really completed it. I mean, I've completed the campaign on normal difficulty, and it was so much fun. Please refer to my previous Aliens Fire Team Elite, a love story video to see exactly what I mean. And yes, there will be spoilers. Um, but honestly, completing this campaign on normal difficulty is basically just the tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> because there is so much more going on under the surface the way the different classes interact with each other uh, the complexity of the different skill and perk builds that you can have for each class that completely change the way individual classes play uh, something that did not become apparent until you completed the campaign and leveled up, for example, here I'm playing the Demolisher with the uh, L56A3 smart gun. Um, and at the moment, when you're playing on those lower difficulty settings, as we are here, we're still on normal. It's all about the firepower of your guns. As you're playing through that campaign, and then the first time you unlock Swarm, or is it Horde mode? Which is what we're doing here. Um, you're building up attachments to the weapons that increase the rate of fire and the ammunition capacity and so on and so on and so on. You're building up skill perks that do the same thing. But as you start playing on higher and much more difficult difficulty settings, the raw firepower that you do is still important, but it's not as important as your crowd control abilities, your support abilities. Putting a team together that works becomes far more important than your individual damage output. When I first started playing this game, it did seem like a relatively simple and straightforward, um, gorgeously pretty and with amazingly good sound effects, horde co-op survival shooter. And if you're just playing it on casual or standard difficulty, then that's exactly what it is. But as soon as you start going up those difficult levels, this starts to become a very, very complex tactical game. I do still have issues about its longevity, though. Because you've got those four campaigns with uh, three levels or missions each. And they're big. You know, it, like I said, it takes you at least half an hour to get through each individual campaign level. And once you've done the campaign and you've unlocked the, uh, is it the sixth or the fifth character class? The, marine, the recon marine. And access to this horde uh, survival mode of the game. There is an incentive for you to do those campaign missions multiple times because you need to level up your character class in order to unlock the full range of perks, which will allow you to experiment with the various different tactical options. And you're definitely going to want to level up your weapons to maximum rank because once you've four-starred a weapon, it unlocks features that on higher difficulties you just cannot do without. And while that might seem repetitive and samey and boring, the game does allow you to mix things up with the addition of challenge cards. So, for example, in order to earn bonus experience and credits and level up your weapons and character classes faster, in the mission lobby you can play a challenge card that might, for example, cause all of your weapons to produce three times as much recoil, or randomly turn your motion tracker off. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to be playing through the same levels, 
but they don't have to be exactly the same. Uh, you can use these challenge cards to mix things up a little, to keep it interesting. At the same time, though, there are a finite number of levels that you can play through. And eventually, at some point, you're going to have maxed out every weapon and every character class, and you're going to have figured out the perfect combination, and you're going to be blitzing through those higher difficulty settings. And then, well, then what? So the game is definitely in need of some more content. Also, there appear to be some problems with the public matchmaking. People who don't have readily available pre-made groups of friends are having problems actually getting into a group in order to do the missions without bot teammates. Um, so that is definitely something that the developers do need to address. Plus the thing is, pushing out extra content for a game like this in the shape of new levels and new campaigns is what people have been asking for. It's not an overnight undertaking. I mean, this level that we're in at the moment, this is just the horde mode. And look at it. It's a fairly complex design. We've got some kind of industrial or military facility that's been covered in alien hive stuff. Looks just like the movie Aliens. But it's not actually that big a room. I mean, it's fairly big, but we'd be mad to go deeper into the hive when, you know, our ammunition box is here. This is where we need to stand and fight the incoming waves. This is probably one fifteenth the size of the regular campaign levels. And there are three levels in each campaign. The amount of art assets and level design architecture that goes into building just one of the campaign levels is ridiculous. And then of course it all has to be play tested and fine tuned and they have to make sure it actually works and it's survivable on all difficulty settings. And that amount of work is not something that you can expect a development team of any size to be pushing out on a monthly basis. Honestly, after completing the campaign in this game and then, you know, seeing what the game still had to offer, it's really made me stop and think about what it actually takes to develop a game like this. Because like I said, you can complete the campaign pretty quickly. You could probably do it in a day if you were dedicated and you were playing on casual difficulty setting, but... Well, if playing through the campaign is all that interests you, and, you know, that's a perfectly valid choice for some people, that is really all they're going to be interested in. But if that's the case for you, then you should probably not bother spending any money on this game. Because you'll have a weekend of great fun, and, well, then you'll probably be spending quite a few months waiting for any further levels and campaigns to arrive in the shape of DLC. And if that is the case, then I recommend that you... I can't believe I'm actually saying this. Get Gearbox's Aliens Colonial Marines, because it does have much more of a story experience, even if the story is absolutely terrible and doesn't make the slightest bit of sense whatsoever. Uh, but there's definitely more straightforward gameplay in it, if that's the sort of thing that you're after. On the other hand, if you don't really care about story too much, because like I said, you can complete the story in a weekend, at most, but you do want to test yourself and your friends' abilities against increasingly difficult challenges, trying to figure out the perfect combination of perks, character classes, weapon builds, that works for you and the friends that you play with, then this game is really going to be hard to beat. I do still have concerns about the longevity, of course, and I'm not entirely sure how suitable for a video series it's going to be, because, well, I mean, how many people out there are desperate for video guides on the perfect demolisher build in Aliens Fireteam Elite, for example? Um, and I am very curious to see what kind of DLC Cold Iron Studios are going to be coming up with in order to extend the life of the game. But in the meantime, I'm having an absolute blast playing this game. More fun than I can remember having in a video game in a very long time. And right now I don't really have any concerns about the replayability. Your mileage may of course vary. Dipping back slightly into the topic of absolute scumbag game developers, however, no, we're not talking about wargaming. It's been a while since we talked about Blizzard Activision, isn't it? Because it's absolutely astonishing just how quickly... Blizzard have gone from being arguably the most beloved game developer in the world to one of the most hated. It literally only took three years. There was an article on PC Gamer a couple of weeks ago. Again, one of those things that I meant to talk about in previous episodes of Mingles with Jingles, but, well, you know, other things happened. Now, I'm sure many people would say that 
it started happening when they merged with Activision, or when Activision acquired Vivendi, which was the holding company that owned Blizzard, amongst other things. But that was way back in 2004, and honestly, between 2004 and around about 2018, Blizzard was still doing spectacularly well, and were a respected and much-liked game developer. But 2018 was a pretty bad year for Blizzard, because that's the year that their president and co-founder, Mike Morhane, quit the company after 27 years, and was succeeded by J. Allen Brack. Now, as well as that, 2018 also saw the release of the Battle for Azeroth expansion for Blizzard's flagship title, World of Warcraft. And it was not particularly well received. Have you ever heard of parasitic game design? Parasitic design is not necessarily a bad thing, even though it sounds bad. I mean, it's a parasite, right? But it, it, the term is used to just explain the way a new parasitic system slots into the existing core design of a game. And you know that a new system is parasitic if you could take it away and the rest of the game still stands up and doesn't even notice that it's gone. Doesn't need it to be there in the first place. But the parasitic system needs the rest of the game to work. Probably easier if I just give you an example. 2018, Battle for Azeroth expansion at World of Warcraft introduced Azerite armor, as well as a necklace piece for your character um, that was called the Heart of Azeroth. And the idea was that you would farm this Azerite, a new currency, that could be used to upgrade your Azerite armor and your Heart of Azeroth necklace. Essentially, the items would level up with you as you played through the expansion. But they didn't really add anything new to the game. They certainly didn't make the game play any differently. All they did was just add another grind on top of everything else that you had to grind out throughout that expansion. And the second the next expansion dropped, World of Warcraft Shadowlands, they basically became useless because they stopped levelling up. So, parasitic design. They were a game feature that was only useful during that one specific expansion in World of Warcraft. They didn't affect the way the base game played, and if you took them away, the game worked just fine. And the reason that Blizzard and other game developers are such big fans of parasitic design is because it's easy. It doesn't require that you mess around with the existing base game systems, it doesn't require that you evolve the overall game design, it's just like a module that you slot in when you need it and you switch off when you don't. It's simpler, cheaper and easier to do. Wasn't terribly popular though. And I must give credit here to uh, Josh Strife Hayes for educating me in his fantastic video on this subject as to exactly what parasitic design was. And as he points out in his video, this wasn't even the first time Blizzard had done this in World of Warcraft. In the Warlords of Draenor expansion, players spent the entire expansion building up their garrison. And then when the Legion expansion hit, your garrison became completely irrelevant. During the Legion expansion, a new piece of parasitic design where everybody spent the entire expansion unlocking and upgrading their artifact weapon. And then when the Battle for Azeroth expansion came out, your artifact weapon became completely irrelevant. And of course, in Battle for Azeroth, we had the Azerite items that I've already talked about. Basically, it was a repeating pattern. Every two years, Blizzard would release a new expansion, and the core features of that expansion were some element of parasitic design that was only useful for that expansion, required that expansion to work, and once the expansion was over and done with, became 100% completely irrelevant. This had been going on every two years and every expansion since 2014, and by 2018 players were starting to get a little bit tired of it. So Blizzard had some explaining to do in order to get fans back on side for BlizzCon 2018. So Blizzard really needed a big win. And of course BlizzCon 2018 is when they announced at the end of their keynote presentation that Diablo 4 was going to be a mobile game. Honestly, if you haven't seen that announcement, you need to go and Google it and watch a video, because it is comedy gold. You have to understand that we're talking about BlizzCon, right? It's the gathering of the Blizzard faithful. In previous BlizzCons, and in fact in BlizzCon 2018 up until that point, one of the developers could have walked out on stage and said, hey, how's it going? I just got here fresh from putting babies on spikes, and he would have been greeted with a standing ovation. I mean, that's how slavish... Blizzard's fans were. But when Wyatt Cheng got out on stage and said, yeah, we're doing Diablo 4, and it's a mobile game only, 
the silence <laughs> that greeted that announcement was deafening. And he made it worse. Because afterwards in a Q&A, when a fan got up and said, look, is there even the slightest possibility that you'll also develop it for PC? And he turned around and said, what, don't you guys have phones? <laughs> he wasn't just greeted with silence. The entire auditorium erupted into booze. The writing was on the wall. And then matters were not helped when a month later Blizzard just casually announced that it was trimming the Heroes of the Storm development team and completely killing its entire eSports league right before the 2019 season. And the worst thing was, if your livelihood depended on the game Heroes of the Storm, if you were a member of an eSports team, if you were a commentator dedicated to the game, if you were a member of any of the multitude of support staff that supported the game, there was no advance warning. You found out that you were suddenly out of a job at the same time as everybody else. Then, in early 2019, in an ominous foreshadowing of things to come, a former Blizzard employee posted a lengthy statement on Twitter detailing the extreme bullying and discrimination that he faced while working on the Hearthstone eSports team, going back as far as 2016. When he attempted to resolve these issues with human resources and management, he started to receive negative performance reviews that described him as not a team player and difficult to work with. And then, of course, in 2019, there was the big one that made many people sit up and ask the question, what the hell is going on at Blizzard Activision? Because 2018 had been a record year financially for the company. They'd set all kinds of profit records. So it came as something of a surprise early in 2019 when they announced that in order to save costs, they were going to be firing 800 employees, 8% of its non-managerial workforce. And then, just to add insult to injury and make matters even worse over the course of the rest of the year, they began rehiring employees. Not the same ones, obviously, but for the same positions that they'd just cut. Which eventually culminated in an announcement in 2020 that the company still needed to hire 2,000 more employees to meet new demands. After firing 8% of their workforce. And then, just when you thought things couldn't possibly get any worse for Blizzard, Towards the end of 2019, during a post-match interview at the Asia-Pacific Hearthstone Grand Masters Tournament, a Hong Kong-based player who goes by the name of Blitzchung, during an official interview after he just won one of the matches in the tournament, without any prompting whatsoever, shouted, Liberate Hong Kong! Revolution of our time! While wearing goggles and a face mask. Items commonly worn by protesters to conceal their identity. Blizzard's reaction was measured, proportional and thoughtful. No, of course it wasn't. <laughs> Not only did they fire the two Taiwanese commentators conducting the interview, who, by the way, hadn't asked him for any opinion on the political state of Hong Kong. The player just came out with it. It wasn't their fault, but they got fired anyway. But they suspended the player for a year and forfeited all of the prize money that he earned. The public reaction, in the West at least, was outrage. I mean, this was big news. We all think that, you know, Wargaming's loot boxes in the USS Misery is a big deal, but honestly, outside of the World of Warships community, nobody really cares. But Blizzard's reaction to the outburst from one of their players and the completely disproportionate, over-the-top and hand-fisted way they reacted to it made news on a global level. Not least of which because when Blizzard's new president, J. Allen Brack, was forced to come out and make a non-apology, you know, one of those, we're sorry that you feel that way. Not we're sorry, <laughs> not we're going to do anything about it, not we're going to reverse our decision, just, well, we're sorry that you feel that way. But watching J. Allen Brack contort himself into verbal circles to do absolutely anything other than to admit any kind of fault, or say anything even slightly critical about China, did at least demonstrate just exactly how far up Blizzard Activision's arse China's cock really was. The whole thing very quickly became an international news story. Employees staged a walkout. Outraged players organised boycotts across all of Blizzard games. Major Hearthstone casters resigned. Sponsors like Mitsubishi pulled their support from future events. And American politicians penned a bipartisan letter condemning Blizzard's actions. And then, of course, there was Warcraft 3 reforged first announced during BlizzCon 2018. It was a remaster that was promised to update the original 2002 game's graphics, 
re-record the cutscenes, upgraded user interface and a world editor. But when it launched in January of 2020, it failed to deliver on just about every promise that had been made. It looked worse than the trailer from 2018. The re-recorded voiceovers were scrapped entirely, and features that had been present in Warcraft 3 for decades, clans, offline play, were missing. The new end-user license agreement also gave Blizzard full ownership of any mods that were made in the game, and because it effectively replaced Warcraft 3 entirely, there was no way to go back and play the original without buying a physical copy of a 20-year-old game. People were upset. <laughs> People were very upset. I mean, this isn't what had been advertised, it certainly wasn't what they paid for. And so, once again, in something that was starting to become increasingly formulaic at this point, President J. Allen Brack was wheeled out in front of the cameras to mouth another mealy-mouthed non-apology. Honestly, you'd think he was working for wargaming at this point. And at this point he'd been doing it so often that you'd think he'd start to get better at it, but he never did. Then, something that was going to become very important later in 2021 happened, as one of the biggest names in World of Warcraft's development, Alex Afrasiabi, suddenly departed from Blizzard in circumstances that were a little mysterious. He'd been working as a creative director at Blizzard for years, and Blizzard had made no statement whatsoever about his departure from the company. In fact, people only noticed it after he'd updated his LinkedIn page to confirm that he was no longer working at Blizzard Activision. All of this, however, would become relevant in 2021, when the state of California launched a lawsuit against Blizzard Activision, citing, amongst many other things, sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, all kinds of misconduct, which Blizzard, of course, strongly denied, issuing counter-statements, claiming that the lawsuit was entirely without merit, frivolous, and a complete waste of everybody's time, because Blizzard, of course, was entirely committed to an inclusive and respectful work environment. In support of these statements defending the company from the California lawsuit, two and a half thousand Blizzard employees signed an open letter condemning the leadership of the company and demanding accountability, and hundreds of them staged a walkout in protest. That's not a good look, is it? <laughs> Poor old J. Allen Brack. I mean, I shouldn't feel sorry for him, but at this point I actually kind of do. Once again being wheeled out in front of the cameras to protest his company's innocence and promise that everything's okay and they respect their employees and this entire lawsuit is completely without merit and then two and a half thousand of his own employees <laughs> sign an open letter condemning him demanding accountability and hundreds more walk out in protest like I said it's not a great look and then despite Blizzard's claims that there was absolutely no case to answer it turned out do you remember Alex Afrasiabi the guy who suddenly and mysteriously left Blizzard, and one of the few people, along with J. Allen Brack himself, specifically named in the sexual harassment and discrimination lawsuit. Yeah, Blizzard spokesman confirmed in an interview with Kotaku that he had actually been fired for misconduct in his treatment of other employees. So, question, how can you tell J. Allen Brack is lying? Answer, his lips are moving. But three years, that's all it took from 2018 to 2021. Three short years is all it took for Blizzard Activision, once arguably the most popular and beloved game developer on the planet, well, not so much Activision, but definitely Blizzard, three short years to go from hero to zero. And all it took was an atmosphere of complete contempt for all the people who work for you, a stubborn refusal to entertain the very concept that it's possible that you may not be making the 100% best decisions regarding game development 100% of the time, and that anybody who isn't you could possibly have any kind of valid or worthwhile ideas on the subject. A history of consistently and regularly refusing to offer any actual apology every time you get your hand caught in the cookie jar and instead just lay it all down to miscommunication and promise to do better in future. When your non-apologies don't work, every now and then, toss a sacrificial scapegoat under the bus in order to appease the masses bellowing for somebody's blood, and then a few months later, once all the fuss has died down and everybody's forgotten about it, give them a quiet promotion to reward them for their sacrifice and loyalty to the company. Oh, hang on, I'm talking about wargaming again, aren't I? 
<laughs> Damn it. And I was doing so well. The thing is, though, look at where Blizzard started off. Right, they had a long way to fall, and it only took them three years to do it. Wargaming, by contrast, hasn't even started off from that high on the totem pole. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Which I suppose means they don't have that far to fall. But if Blizzard can fall that far in three years, what price wargaming? Anyway, I think it's high time I got down off my soapbox and gave somebody else a chance. So, that was today's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you maybe learnt something. At the very least, I hope you found it slightly entertaining. And of course, as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.